What's up guys? Welcome back to Investing PH. Today we will evaluate the largest producer of nickel laterite ore in the Philippines and also one of the largest in the world. This is Nickel Asia Corporation. This is a continuation of our analysis of nickel mining companies. So if you haven't yet watched my analysis of Global Ferro Nickel, I suggest you watch it first. Link in the description below. Anyway, let's see if this company is a good investment or not. So let's start. Once again, before we start, this video is for educational purposes only and should not be used as basis for any of your investing decisions. And I would appreciate it if you would smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. And if you aren't still a subscriber, do click the subscribe button as well. So who is Nickel Asia Corporation? Founded in 1977, wherein they started their first nickel operations in Rio Tuba, Bataraza, Palawan. Since then, they have expanded their mining and is now the largest producer of nickel lateritic ore and also one of the largest in the world. They also have interest in the renewable energy sector. Their corporate structure are as follows. So they also have operations in gold and copper exploration and in the energy sector as well, wherein they are focusing in renewable energy. Though they have interest in this division, this only plays a small portion of their revenue, which I will show you later on. Mostly, the bulk of their revenue still relies on their nickel production. These are the locations of their mines, exploration projects, and their energy projects. In their nickel business, they have two products which is saprolite and limonite. This is used in different things. The breakdown for the volume of their sales are as follow. So almost an equal amount for the two products. With this, we can see the total cost per wet metric tons had been increasing since 2018. Their customers are China, Japan, and of course, our country as well. The revenue breakdown are as follow, so a huge portion is in China. Now, like what I said in my previous video, China is now the largest manufacturer of electric vehicles. That's why this is their largest customer and Japan is also in the top as well. If you look at their overall revenue for the whole company, like what was mentioned a while ago, the bulk of their revenue comes from their ore business, which is more than 90% of it. Their other business such as their interest in power only takes up a small portion. With this, since nickel is the main bulk, they are really affected by the price fluctuations of nickel. So if you look at the past prices of nickel, we can see it goes up and down. Right now, nickel prices is increasing. One main factor for this is the rise of electric vehicle demand wherein nickel is used for the battery. But of course, even with the demand of nickel increasing, we have to know if this company will be producing more nickel in the succeeding years. This is their total ore reserves as of December 31, 2020 for their different mines. So this is in thousands. For their saprolite, they have 113 million wet metric tons of reserves that has 1.45% nickel and 13.60% iron. For their limonite, they have 178 million wet metric tons of ore reserves that has 1.05% of nickel and 42.32% iron. Now everyone knows that mining damages the environment. That's why the company has to be responsible in their mining operations. Nickel Asia has received countless of awards in their different mines. With that said, to be awarded with environmental awards for their mining, I think they are responsible enough for their line of business. You can check their annual reports to further research their environmental projects, how they are balancing the effects of their business, since I won't be tackling on this topic too much. With that said, let's go to their financials. We would still be following our checklist in valuating this company. To further understand each line of it, I suggest you watch my other stock analysis videos, especially my valuation of their competitor, which is Global Ferro Nickel or FNI. Link in the description below. First, let's look at their income statement. Now, just like FNI, their revenue and net income fluctuated quite a bit, especially in 2014 to 2017. If you look at the revenue growth, they had a sudden rise in 2014, then a decrease in 2015 to 2017. Now, if we also look at nickel prices back then, it also decreased. But as we go on further to 2021, it had already passed its 2014 mark, wherein we can see the reaction as well to Nickel Asia's revenue growth. But even though with the decrease in 2015 to 2017, we can see the trajectory of the revenue is still in the positive trend. It's just that 2014 was an exceptional year. So for their latest 12 months, they now have gone past their 2014 mark. Let's see if this will continue up to the end of 2021. Since there are still a few months left, moving to their net income, almost the same, but they still haven't yet matched up to their 2014 level, even in their latest 12 months. 
But even with that, their net income compounded growth rate from 2010 to 2020 is at 11.34%. Now, I still didn't include their latest 12 month for the compounded growth rate since there are still a few months left for year 2021. Moving on, we can see why 2014 was the highest. Their margin was 35.24% during that time. Though their margin for the past 10 years is sitting at 20%, it's almost the same with their competitor FNI, which sits around 21%. With that, even with the fluctuations in the past years, their overall growth is quite good for revenue growing at a compounded growth rate of 9.86% and their net income at 11.34% and as well as their net income margin is in line with their industry average, so it's a check for me. Moving on to their balance sheet. So for 2010 to 2020, they only had two years of negative growth and in those two years, it's not that much of a negative growth. This was in 2015 and 2020. So for 2020, the decrease was due to their current liabilities. So even though their assets increased, the increase in their liabilities was much greater. This offsets that growth leading to a negative growth in their equity. But even with that, their 10-year compounded growth rate is sitting at 6.67%. So for their industry, this is quite the normal growth since FNI is also growing at this rate, which is 6.87%, only slightly higher compared to them. Moving on to their ROE, they have a 5-year average of 9.8%, so quite low compared to their competitor. FNI has a 5-year ROE average of 14.3%, so not bad but I want a bit higher ratio for this one. ROE indicates how well the company is using equity capital in producing net profits. The higher the average, the better the management team in producing net profits using available capital. Now let's see if they aren't relying on too much debt to increase their ROE growth. So their debt to equity ratio is sitting at 0.43. So really low, this means they have 0.43 peso of debt for every one peso of equity, which is really good since what I want here is for this ratio to be below two. So I use this guide in evaluating the debt to equity ratio. For FNI, they have a ratio of 0.49. Moving on to their cash flow statements, so they never had a negative cash flow on hand ever since 2010 and they had been increasing it as well with a compounded growth rate of 20% in the past 10 years which is really great. So with their free cash on hand, let's see if they can pay up their long term debt in just under 3 years. For their latest 12 month, they can pay it up in just under 0.10 years so in a snap, they can be free of long term debt. Another check for me, comparing it to FNI, they have no long term debt. So both companies pass this valuation very well. Moving on, let's see if they are also handling their short-term obligations well. This is the current ratio. With that, they have a current ratio of 1.92, meaning they have 1.92 peso of current assets for every 1 peso of current liabilities. Comparing it to FNI, they have a current ratio of 2.27. So another check for me since what I want here is for current ratio to be at least between 1 and 2. For their PE ratio, they have a price to earnings ratio of 11.96, so still under what I want which is below 15. This means you are willing to pay 11.96 peso to earn 1 peso. For their dividends, the company regularly pays out dividends. For 2020, they had a yield of 5.35% for the current price and for 2021, their yield for the current price is 4.09%. So quite high, but in some years, the company doesn't pay out special dividends. So we are unsure if they will pay out the same rate for the succeeding years. Since again, dividends is in line with the profits of the company. For the company's mode, now their financials are solid as well. Revenue and net income is growing at a good rate. Equity as well is also growing in line with their industry. They have a very well handled long-term and short-term debt. And size-wise, Nickel Asia is the largest in our country and is also one of the largest producer of nickel in the world. So that too is a good economic mode for them, dominating market shares for a long time in their line of business. Moving on to their leader, their leader is Gerard H. Brimo. So he has handled a lot of companies. He's the chairman of different companies as well. One is Felix Mining Corporation, which is served from 1994 to 2003. He also served as a president of the Chamber of Mines of the Philippines from 1993 to 1995 and as chairman from 1995 to 2003 and was elected back again as chairman in 2017 at which he currently holds up to today. So with that, we can see he has a lot of experience in the mining field. Lastly, is it within my buy below price? My computed intrinsic value for them is 8.33 with a 30% margin of safety. My buy below price is at 5.83. With that, Nickel Asia only failed in my ROE valuation since that's the only thing they lag behind compared to their competitor. Again, 
nickel prices is soaring up due to the demand of electric vehicles. The only downside to it is what if they make a better battery that doesn't need nickel in it. Although there are already batteries out there that doesn't use nickel, it still doesn't compare to the capabilities of it. That's why it's really a must to have a good margin of safety and to use conservative growth rates for your intrinsic value computation because no one knows what will happen in the future. Although the good side of it is the company has good financials, that's also a good margin of safety for me. So this ends my valuation. Again, would like to remind you guys, this is just an introduction of the company. If you like it so far, then do your thorough analysis. My video is just a preview of the company. Never rely on it for your investing decisions. With that said, I hope you liked the video. And if you still haven't clicked that like button, now is the time you do so. And if you still aren't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Click that subscribe button as well. If I miss out on some key datas, would really appreciate it if you comment it down below for everyone to see. So thank you and see you in the next video.